without bones, we would be a formless mass. And so bones are responsible for the structural framework that we have. So in this chapter, we're going to cover the axial skeleton. But in general, the bones of the skeleton, uh, as adults, we have 206 bones, whereas children and infants have somewhere around 300 bones. There are two major divisions of the skeletal system. We have the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton is going to contain the skull, the vertebral column, and the bony thorax. And so this is along the central axis of the body. The function of the axial skeleton is to provide a framework that supports and protects the organs, and especially some special sense organs, such as organs for hearing, balance, taste, smell, and vision, which are going to be found within the cranium, as well as providing area for attachment of skeletal muscles. The appendicular skeleton consists of the bones of the appendages, which are the upper and lower limbs, and the bones that hold the limbs to the trunk, so the pectoral and the pelvic girdles. Our frontal bone is going to be one of the bones of the cranium. And so there are eight bones of the cranium that are going to help the, surround our brain. And so the first one, the frontal, is an unpaired bone, and it has some special regions that we find. The first one is the supraorbital margin, and so these are going to form the superior ridges of the orbit, which the orbit is surrounding our eye. The next structure of the frontal bone is going to be the supraorbital foramen, and so these are going to be found at the midpoints of each supraorbital margin, and these are going to be holes that allow for access to the frontal sinuses. And we also have the glabella, which is going to be the part of the frontal bone that is between the two superciliary arches. And we also have the superciliary arches, which are going to be our brow ridges. And so, in general, male skulls tend to have more pronounced superciliary arches than female skulls do. The parietal bones are going to be paired, and they form the lateral walls and roof of the cranium. With each parietal bone, it is bordered by four sutures that unite them to their neighboring bones of the skull. The squamous region of the temporal bone is going to be the lateral flat surface of the temporal bone that is immediately inferior to the squamous suture. The zygomatic process of the temporal bone is going to curve laterally and anteriorly to unite with a temporal process of the zygomatic bone. And, and so together, when we have the unison of both processes of both bones, that is the zygomatic arch. Each temporal bone articulates with the mandible inferiorly to the base of both zygomatic processes in a depression called the mandibular fossa. And when we have articulation between the mandible and the temporal bone, such as what I've circled in the left figure, this is where we find the temporal mandibular joint, or the TMJ. The carotid canal, which is the yellow arrow on the right image of the inferior view of the skull, is going to be medial to the styloid process, and it transmits the internal carotid artery 
to the brain. The external auditory canal is going to serve as the entrance to, from the external ear to the middle ear. And so that we will find on the external or lateral view of the temporal bone. In a medial or inner view of the temporal bone, we find the internal acoustic meatus or the internal auditory canal. And so this then serves as a passage for nerves and blood vessels to and from the middle ear, where then that will send signals that will go on to our brain. The occipital bone is going to form the posterior region of the skull and the base of the cranium. The first structure that we see is the large circular opening, and this is the foramen magnum, and this is where we have the mandula oblongata of the brain connecting to the spinal cord. And so this is where we have the separation from our brain and our spinal cord. Just lateral to the magnum foramen is going to be the occipital condyles, which are going to be smooth knobs. And these smooth knobs, the occipital condyles, are going to articulate with the first cervical vertebrae. And so when you nod your head yes, you're moving the occipital condyles against the first cervical vertebrae. The external occipital protuberance is going to be the big bump that you feel in the back of your head and the external occipital crest is going to be a, um, it, oh, I'm sorry, it's going to project into the posterior direction from the frame and magnum, and then it ends at the occipital protuberance. The superior and the inferior nuchal lines are going to be the intersections of the external occipital crest at horizontal ridges. And so the horizontal ridges of the superior and inferior nuchal lines are important for attachments of ligaments and neck muscles. In general, males tend to have larger occipital protuberances as well as larger nuchal lines because of more the larger muscle and ligament attachments that are found. The sphenoid bone is an irregular bone, and it resembles the shape of a butterfly, and it's also known as the bridging bone of the skull because it connects the cranial and the facial bones that articulate with most of the other bones of the skull. The sphenoid has a thick body that is found medially of the bone, and this is where the sphenoid sinuses are found. On lateral to the body, we find the greater and the lesser wings of the sphenoid. Also, there is a prominent midline depression where we find the cella turstica, and this is where the cella turstica houses the pituitary gland. Anterior to the cella turstica, we find the optic foramen or optic canal, and it also is a, on the superior surface of the sphenoid bone. The optic foramen houses optic nerves, which is cranial nerve number two, and this is where we have visual information that travels from the eyes to the brain that go through these foramen or canals. The ethmoid bone is an irregular shaped bone that's found between the orbits and forms the roof of the nasal cavity and part of the nasal septum. The superior part of the ethmoid bone exhibits 
a thin mid-sagittal elevation called the Cristagalli, which is like the rooster's comb, which is what it's actually named after. And we have this because it's important for the attachment of the falx cerebi, which is a membranous sheet that helps to support the brain. Lateral to the Cristagalli, we have the cribriform plate, and so that's lateral to both sides of the Cristagalli, and they have numerous holes, and then so that makes up the cribriform foramina. And so these foramina allow passage for the olfactory nerve, or cranial nerve number one. The inferior midline projection of the ethmoid bone is called the perpendicular plate, and this forms the superior part of our nasal septum. Sutures are immovable joints that form the boundaries between the cranial bones, and it is dense regular connective tissue that seals these cranial bones together firmly at a suture. So kind of like puzzle pieces to form a strong union or articulation. So the four different sutures that, we ha that we'll cover are the coronal suture, which, which extends across the superior surface of the skull along a coronal or frontal plane, and it represents articulation between the frontal bone and the parietal bones. The sagittal suture will extend between the superior midlines of the coronal and lamboidal sutures, and is found in the midline of the cranium along with the mid-sagittal plane, and the articulation that we find between the right and left parietal bones. The squamosal suture will be to the sides of the skull where we have articulation with the, of the temporal bone and the parietal bone on that side. The squamous or flat part of the temporal bone typically overlaps the parietal bone. And finally, we have the lamboidal suture. And so this extends like an arc across the posterior surface of the skull where it articulates with the parietal bone and the occipital bone. Infant cranial bones are connected by flexible areas of dense regular connective tissue. And that's because the bones aren't big enough to fully surround the brain yet. And one other purpose that these fontanelles serve is that they act as the soft, or they're known as the soft spots on baby's head, where they allow for molding of the cranium so that it is able to pass through the birth canal, which most babies that um, are born vaginally, they have a cone head shape, but after a few days, typically it, its curvature has re, um, gone back to normal. So we have two zygomatic bones, and our zygomatic bones are commonly referred to as our cheekbones, and they form the part of the lateral, lateral wall of each orbit in the cheeks. So the zygomatic arch is formed by the articulation of the temporal process of each zygomatic bone with the zygomatic process of each temporal bone. We also have a maxillary process, which articulates with the zygomatic process of the maxilla. And then we have a frontal process, which articulates with the frontal bone. We have two lacrimal bones, which in this diagram, that would be the red bones, which are above the maxilla within the orbit. And a special feature with the lacrimal bones is that they have a lacrimal groove, which provides a passageway for the nasal lacrimal duct, allowing drainage of, fear, of tears within the nasal cavity. We have two nasal bones, and these form the bridge of the nose, and these bones are, typically, are often fractured due to uh, blows of the nose. The vomer is an unpaired bone that has a triangular shape to it. It articulates along the midline with both the maxilla and the palatine bones, and anteriorly, both the vomer and the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone form the bony nasal septum. And so on the bottom images, what we have, the vomer is actually going to be just that little 
bit of red that is sticking up that will be beneath the ethmoid. The inferior nasal conchae are going to be paired bones that are located on the inferolateral wall of the nasal cavity, and their purpose is to help create turbulence of inhaled air. The palatine bones are going to be small paired bones that have a distinct L shape to them. They form part of the hard palate, the nasal cavity, and the eye orbit. The posterior one-third portion of the hard palate is formed by the horizontal plate of the palatine bones, and the anterior two-thirds of the hard palate is created by the maxilla. The perpendicular plate forms part of the lateral wall of the nasal cavity and will be perpendicular to the horizontal plate. The maxilla are paired bones that form the central part of the facial skeleton. We have a right and a left maxilla that unite together to form the upper jaw. When we have problems with their unison and formation, then we have an incomplete upper jaw, and so individuals that have a cleft lip or cleft palate have incomplete articulation with both the left and right maxilla. And so the hard palate is created by the maxilla and the palatine bones. So two, the anterior two-thirds of the hard palate is created by the maxilla. The posterior one-third of the hard palate is going to be created by the palatine bones. And then we have the alveolar processes, which these house the upper teeth, and so they will be found at inferior portions of the maxilla. The mandible is a single bone that forms the entire lower jaw. It supports the inferior teeth and provides attachment for muscles of mastication or chewing. So the body of the mandible is going to be horizontally and the two vertical to oblique ascending to posterior regions are called the rami or the ramus for one single side. The mental protuberance is going to be the point of the chin. The coronoid process is going to be the anterior projection of the ramus. And this is where we have the insertion point for the temporalis muscle, which is going to be a strong muscle for closing the mouth. The mandibular condyle is going to be the posterior projection of each ramus. And when we have articulation with the mandibular condyle at the mandibular fossa of the, tem of the temporal bone, we have collectively the temporal mandibular joint, which allows us to move our lower jaw when we talk and chew. The alveolar process, which is similar to what we have in the maxilla, it are the processes that house our teeth. The mandibular foramen is going to be found in the posterior superior end, and it will be on the inside of our mouth. And this provides for a passageway for blood vessels and nerves that innervate our lower teeth. The mental foramen, however, is going to be on the anterior lateral surface of the body, and it, will, and it penetrates the body on each side of the chin to provide passageways for nerves and blood vessels. And so the mental will be closest to our chin, whereas the mandibular foramen will be farther away from our chin. So to review, when we have more than two bones to make up a certain structure, uh, first is the hard palate. Again, the hard palate is composed of the maxilla and the palatine bone. The maxilla are the anterior two-thirds of the hard palate, and the palatine bone will be the posterior one-third. The zygomatic arch is the unison of the temporal and zygomatic bones, and they are formed at each of the processes.
The orbit is made of seven bones where we have the frontal bone, the sphenoid, the zygomatic bone, the maxilla, palatine, lacrimal, and ethmoid bones. Our nasal cavity is from the unison of our ethmoid, palatine, maxilla, inferior nasal concave, vomer, and our sphenoid bones. So we have uh, sinuses within our nasal cavity, and so these are going to be the paranasal sinuses. And we have the ethmoidal, the frontal, maxillary, and the sphenoidal sinuses, which are going to be connected to the bones that they're located in. And so all sinuses have a mucus lining that helps to humidify and warm air, which is especially important when we're in cold weather. Another feature of the sinuses is that it helps to create a lighter skull instead of having solid bone mass, yeah. and then also to help provide resonance for our voice. Again, the four sinuses are the frontal, sphenoidal, ethmoidal, and the maxillary. And our frontal sinuses, some people actually don't develop these, uh, but if we do, we tend to see these develop around 6 to 10 years of age, whereas the sphenoidal and ethmoidal bones typically do not become infected. Um, and maxillary sinuses typically are the ones that will become infected when we have a cold or sinus pressure. And so here are some differences where we have um, on the top left hand the healthy sinus. We have these pockets of holes that are just filled with normal mucus. Then when we have sinusitis, then what can occur is that there is actually inflammation of the mucous lining of the epithelial tissue. And so this can make it feel like you have excess mucus that is built up and backed up. And, um, and so what can happen is that these can also become infected too. And so drainage might be slower than normal. Our hyoid bone is going to be the only bone within our body that does not articulate with any bone, other bone within the skeleton. It has a slender curved bone or appearance and it's found inferior to the skull between the mandible and the larynx or the voice box. And also this is found at the base of our tongue and so this allows for when movement for when we speak and when we swallow. The three smallest bones that we find within the skeleton are the ear ossicles, and we find this within the middle ear. Um, we have the malleus, which is going to have a hammer-like appearance, and this will be from connected to the tympanic membrane and closest to the external ear. Then we have the incus, which has the appearance of an anvil, and that is in between the malleus and the stapes. And then we have the stapes, which is the smallest of the three, and it resembles a stirrup, which that is connected then to the inner ear, which is then important for transmission of different sound waves from what we hear, and then have that signaling to our brain. The vertebral column is composed of 26 bones, where we have the composition being 24 individual vertebrae, plus the sacrum and the coccyx. The functions of the vertebral canal are to provide vertical support of the body, support the weight of the head, to help align and maintain an upright body posture, to help transfer axial skeletal weight to the appendicular skeleton of the lower limb, to help and protect the spinal cord, and to provide a passageway for spinal nerves. So we find seven cervical vertebrae, which form the bones of the neck. We have 12 thoracic vertebrae, which form the superior region of the back. And each vertebrae articulates laterally with one or two pairs of ribs. We have five lumbar vertebrae that form the inferior concave region of the back, or the small of the back. We have the sacrum that is formed from five sacral vertebrae that fuse together. And then we have the coccyx, which commonly referred to as our tailbone. And so we don't see the fusion of the sacrum until we hit about 26. And so that's why infants and young children tend to have more bones than adults do.
The anterior region of each vertebrae is a rounded or cylindrical body, which is the weight-bearing structure of almost all vertebrae. Posterior to the vertebral body is the vertebral arch, and the vertebral arch, along with the body, enclose a roughly circular opening called the vertebral foramen. When all of the vertebral foramen are stacked together in a superior to inferior direction, this is where we find the vertebral canal that houses the spinal cord. The lateral openings that are found adjacent between the vertebra are the intervertebral foramina, and this is where we have a direct passageway for the spinal nerves that travel to the other parts of the body. The vertebral arch is composed of two pedicles and two laminae. The pedicles originate from the posterior lateral margins of the body, and the laminae extend posterior medially from the posterior edge of each pedicle. The sinus process projects posteriorly from the left and right lamina, and so this is what can be palpated through the skin of the back. The lateral projections on both sides of the vertebral arch are called the transverse processes. Each vertebrae has an articular process on both its superior and inferior surfaces that project from the junctions between the pedicles and the laminae. The inferior articular process of each vertebrae articulate with the superior articular process of the vertebrae immediately inferior to it. Each articular process has a smooth surface or a groove and this is the articular facet. The angles of the facets differ along the length of the vertebral column due to the different movements of the vertebral column at certain locations. The intervertebral discs are going to be past the fibrocartilage found in between vertebrae. They act as shock absorbers between the vertebral bodies and allow for the vertebral column to bend. There are two regions of an intervertebral disc. We have the annulus fibrosus, which is going to be the outer ring of the fibrocartilage. And we have the nucleus pulposus, which is the inner circular region of the intervertebral disc. The nucleus pulposus has a high water content, and it has this gelatinous consistency to it. We have seven cervical vertebrae, and these are going to be the most superiorly placed vertebrae. They extend inferiorly from the occipital bone of the skull through the neck to the thorax. Cervical vertebrae support only the weight of the head, and thus their vertebral bodies are relatively small and light. The bodies of cervical vertebrae C3 to C6 are relatively small compared to its foramen. The superior surface of the cervical vertebrae body is concave from side to side, and it has the superior slope from the posterior edge to the anterior edge. Also, the spinous process is relatively short, and the tips of each process tend to have this bifurcated or split appearance. C7 is the only one that does not have a bifurcated sinus process, however. The first cervical vertebrae is called the atlas, and this supports the head with its articulation with the occipital condyles of the occipital bone. And so this allows us to have a nod our heads and give us the yes movement. And where the condyles articulate with the atlas are found at the lateral masses of the C1 vertebrae. The atlas also lacks a body in the spinous process. The second cervical vertebrae is termed the axis, and this has a prominent feature 
which is called the DEN, or the odontoid process. And so this allows us to have rotation and allow for our no movements of our head. Both the dens and the spinal cord occupy the vertebral foramen at the level of the axis, and thus any trauma that dislocates the dens can result in severe injury. And so if the dent should break off, this could allow for either being a quadriplegic or it could result in death due to the damage that is occurring at that level of the spinal cord and so close to the brain. There are 12 thoracic vertebrae, and each vertebrae articulates with the ribs. The thoracic vertebrae lack the mobility of the other vertebrae due to their stabilizing articulation with their ribs. The vertebrae of the thoracic vertebrae have a heart-shaped body, and its spinous process is relatively pointed and long. There's also uh, demifacets on the lateral sides of the body and on the sides of the transverse processes. The demifacets are semicircular depressions that articulate with either the superior or inferior edge of the head of the wrist. Vertebrae 1 through 10 have transverse facets on their transverse processes, whereas T11 and T12 lack these transverse facets because the 11th and 12th ribs do not have tubercles, and they don't articulate with the transverse processes. There are five lumbar vertebrae, and these are the largest vertebrae that we have within the column. The bodies of the lumbar vertebrae tend to be the thickest, and the superior and inferior surfaces are oval-shaped rather than heart-shaped. The transverse processes are thin, and they project dorsolaterally, and the spinous process are thick and they project dorsally. Since the lumbar vertebrae bear most of the weight of the body, the thick spinous processes provide extensive surface area for the attachment of the inferior back muscles that reinforce or adjust the lumbar curvature. Also, the vertebral foramina tend to have a triangular shape to them when compared to the cervical and the thoracic vertebrae. The sacrum is going to have an anterior curve to it, and it has a somewhat triangular appearance that forms the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity. We have horizontal lines of fusion that are called the transverse ridges that, uh, that are visible once they completely fuse somewhere between ages of 20 and 30 years of age. The superior articular process is going to be superior where the sacrum articulates with the last lumbar vertebrae and inferiorly it articulates with the coccyx. The vertebral canal becomes much narrower and continues through the sacrum at the sacral canal. The sacral canal terminates in an inferior opening called the sacral hiatus. The dorsal ridge that we find is the medial sacral crest, and it's formed by the fusion of the spinous process of individual sacral vertebrae. Also on the dorsal surface, we find four pairs of openings for spinal nerves, and these are the sacral foramina. On each lateral surface of the sacrum, we find the ala, which means the wings of the sacrum. The coccyx is going to be the formation, the fusion of four small coccygeal vertebrae that fuse around the age of 25. The coccyx serves as an attachment site for several ligaments and some muscles. In males, the coccyx tends to project anteriorly, whereas in females, it tends to project more inferiorly, so not to obstruct the birth canal.
Herniated discs occur when the gelatinous nucleus pulposus protrudes into or through the annulus fibrosus, and this creates a bulging of the disc posterolaterally into the vertebral canal, and where this pinches the spinal cord and nerves of the spinal cord. So there are different pains associated with the location of the herniated disc, and so if the herniated disc occurs within the cervical vertebrae. This can cause neck pain and pain down the upper limbs. And the most common um, cervical disc ruptures occur between vertebrae C5 and C6 or C6 and C7. Lumbar herniated discs, however, are associated with low back pain. And so patients feel pain down the entire lower limb. And so this is also associated with sciatica, where the most common lumbar disc rupture occurs between lumbar 4 and lumbar 5. With aging and development, what we have are differences with our spinal curvature that develop with additional weight-bearing activities, such as with just simply holding our head or with sitting up. And so what we have is going from a completely rounded um, vertebral column when we're in utero to having some small curvature when we become newborn. When we progress into adolescence and adulthood, what we find is that the cervical as well as the lumbar regions tend to project anteriorly, whereas the thoracic and the sacral regions tend to project posteriorly. Some abnormal curvatures of the spine include um, scoliosis, which is the most common uh, curvature deformity, and it might affect either one or more of the movable vertebrae, and typically it's found within the thoracic region. Uh, scoliosis tends to affect females more than males, and especially during um, adolescence. Kyphosis is going to be an exaggerated thoracic curvature that's directed posteriorly and it produces this hunchback look and this is commonly caused due to osteoporosis. And thirdly, lordosis is going to be an exaggerated lumbar curvature that's often called a swayback where there's a protrusion of the abdomen and buttocks that causes the abnormal curvature. And so this is often seen with pregnancy and obesity. So the thoracic cage consists of thoracic vertebrae posteriorly, the ribs laterally, and the sternum anteriorly. It acts as a protective framework for vital organs of the heart, the lungs, the trachea, and the esophagus, and also provides attachment points for many muscles that support the pectoral girdles, the chest, the neck, and the shoulders, the back, and the muscles involved for respiration. The sternum is often referred to as the breastbone, and it is a flat bone that forms the anterior midline of the thoracic wall. And it has a shape similar to that of a sword. The first part, the manubrium, is the widest and the most superior portion of the sternum, where it acts as articulation with clavicles, as well as with the first rib costal cartilage. The body is going to be the longest part of the sternum and it forms the bulk or the blade of the, of the sword and that articulates with the costal cartilage of ribs 2 to 7. And the xiphoid process is going to be the very tip of the saw, sword blade that is the small inferiorly pointed projection that is cartilaginous it doesn't ossify until we're about 40 years of age. It's very important that the xiphoid process is not broken when there's strong impact or when individuals administer CPR, as this could severely damage the lungs or the heart, as well as the liver, which are all within that region. The ribs are elongated, curved, flattened bones that originate on or between the thoracic vertebrae and end in the anterior wall of the thorax. Ribs 1 through 7 are called true ribs because 
they connect individually to the sternum by separate cartilaginous extensions of costal cartilage. Ribs 8 through 12 are false ribs because their costal cartilage does not directly attach to the sternum. Ribs 8 through 10 fuse to the costal cartilage of rib 7 and thus indirectly articulate with the sternum. And ribs 11 and 12 are called floating ribs because they have no connection to the sternum.